It's a great pleasure and honour uh, to be able to talk to you today. Uh, thank you also primarily for you all to come. It's, uh, it's very exciting for me to see so many of you here and to know um, that uh, we have in the audience members from, uh, from the government sector, from the business, from industry, commercial arms, students. So it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity uh, for us, I think, to, to discuss um, this exciting topic which really crosses um, all of those different areas. It's relevant um, for all of the uh, different people. Uh, now, when um, Paul Babby uh, spoke to me in, uh, initially, I'm very grateful uh, that he asked me and invited me to, to talk. Um, we spoke about you know, what might be a possible topic. So I do some research in the area of financial services, uh, sports sponsoring and, and corporate social responsibility. Uh, but really, it only took me about a split second <laughs> to decide that university business collaboration would be the topic um, that would be, um, would be discussed today because it's, it's the topic that's closest to my heart. Now, if you've followed uh, university business collaboration and are interested in that topic um, over recent years, um, you would have seen um, a lot of discussion around it in the academic literature, uh, government reports, industry reports, uh, in the newspaper. Uh, those of you might have seen uh, Q and A um, on uh, about ten days ago on the Monday. Now, the discussion has moved very much from a sort of one directional exploitation of, of research and a technology push to a lot more of a collaboration and relational um, perspective. However, if you, if you look at a lot of those reports and those, those discussions, quite often they take a very sim, uh, single perspective. Um, so either looking at purely innovation or research oriented relationships, um, more coming up also the educational relationship as well. So what I'd like to do today is actually stimulate uh, the discussion around sort of a broader perspective um, on the topic, but also draw on some of the research uh, that I've been doing both here in Australia um, as well as in Germany as well. But first of all, I'd like to start with a little story. Now, I found by talking to people here, it's actually something that's not very well known uh, in Australia. Uh, it is based on uh, one of the most famous uh, children's novels um, in Germany, written by Michael Ende and published in 1960. Uh, it was translated into 33 language, uh, languages, so I very much hope that maybe some of you um, have actually heard about it. It's called uh, Jim Button and, the engine and Luke the Engine Driver. And in one of those um, adventures uh, that they embarked on, uh, so you see um, uh, Jim uh, there, Jim Button and, and Luke, um, they got stuck in a desert. And not, you know, it wasn't bad enough that they were just stuck in a desert with no water um, and their little train stuck in the sand. They suddenly saw this giant arise on the horizon, talking very nicely and very friendly, asking them to come closer and, and, and asking whether he could come closer as well. So they had the courage in the end to, OK, move, uh, move forward, move closer, said, OK, we're coming. Um, and what they found is, the closer they got and the, the more they allowed the giant to actually come closer, the smaller the giant became. And, that, as, and as soon as they actually stand, stood next to each other and talked to each other, they were both exactly the same size. And as they started talking and shook hands, um, they heard the story that really that, it's called a Steinriese, so an imaginary giant, I guess, and it translated, uh, that he was very lonely. So what they ended up doing is actually brought them, they brought the um, Scheinreise to the little island, which was small enough um, that really no one had to fear the giant because no one was able to actually get far enough away. So it was fantastic for the Scheinreise, but on the other hand, it also was fantastic for uh, the people on the little island uh, that Jim and Luke um, lived on because the island was always too small to actually house a lighthouse. Yeah, so now they actually had a living lighthouse to keep them safe. Now, the reason why I love this story and why I don't usually talk about the ivory tower, those kinds of things, because I think it, for me, instills the essence of university business collaboration. It's sort of, um, you know, having the com courage uh, to come closer, to move closer together. It's about, you know, recognising the different needs and the different strengths that exist on both sides and really bringing them together for the mutual benefit um, as well. So if we look at that and think about I guess the benefits that we might um, gain from these collaborations. One that quite often comes up is, is the idea of innovation. It's about, and you know, for, for a good reason. Uh, it's about trying to um, generate and exchange uh, knowledge. It's about improving productivity or competitiveness. Um, but really, if we look at the different levels, uh, there's a much broader and much more complex variety of benefits that we can identify. And if you look at the literature, we've done that relatively recently, 
I think we came up with about, I don't know, 10 pages um, or in very small font on various different types of benefits uh, that you might identify. So it might be for the individual academics. Now they might actually see their research uh, in, a different, um, in a different way, seeing how it can be applied in a practical sense. Um, obviously research funding is going to be a relevant one uh, for them, but also inspiration for teaching, inspiration for further research, uh, and just I guess the satisfaction of, of, of making a difference. On the university level, uh, again access to resources at the business side, um, probably access to resources um, that the government provides um, specific to those collaborations, but also input into some of their, their strategies, some of their uh, curri curriculum design, um, and really also providing a fantastic opportunities for their students in maybe having access to business data, having real life experiences as well. Looking at the business side, um, what we find with um, the, the actual individuals from the business side that are part of these collaborations, that they very much enjoy the, uh, I guess, the new perspectives, um, the ideas that they might generate, um, the, the additional knowledge uh, that they might gain, but also I guess the empowerment to, to make a difference too in, the, in, the, in regards to the, to the research and the education com component. For the organisation, uh, really two main things uh, that come up. Uh, one of them is innovation, it's, 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 it's uh, knowledge, access to ideas um, and, and really access to the, the, the skilled um, and, and the skilled um, individuals that they have at the university. But really what stands out, I guess, from a, for a, from a university as a partner is also the access to all the students and therefore the sort of skilled workforce um, that they're looking for as well. Now you might be part of the business side that I talked about or part of the university side or part of the students. Um, what if you're not? You know, you, you might ask yourself, well, is it relevant for me? Why should I care? Is it important? Does it make an impact or a difference to me as well? Um, this, is a, um, some, uh, this comes from a fantastic book, and I've got an example here, uh, an example here if you wanted to have a look at it later. Uh, that's Ari, Research Innovation, very recently uh, published to celebrate 30 years um, of uh, innovation, partnering, collaboration at the University of Adelaide. And what it shows really is a, you know, an everyday scene uh, with everyday people uh, that you will see at, at each corner. And if you have a look at the different red dots that are on that slide, these are all things that have been significantly impacted and, and, and improved by the collaborative research, by the innovation that's come out of the university and university business collaboration. So it ranges from pregnancy uh, to health, um, road safety, uh, there is uh, furniture, uh, and also most importantly things like you know, wine, beer and chocolate as well. So really, the impact can be felt all around us. So when we look at the actual statistics of, well, how much does this collaboration actually happen within Australia, um, it's, I find it somewhat surprising still. So looking at um, Australian Bureau of Statistics data from 2010 to 2012, it says that 5.4% of the innovation active businesses actually collaborate with universities and higher education institutions. Now by itself, um, that's already grown up significantly. So 2006, 2007, it was 1.9%. Then uh, the couple of years after, it was 3.6%. So it's certainly showing uh, you know, a really good upwards trend, but still, um, I guess you'd say relatively limited. Also, if you actually put it into an international comparison, uh, as a study by the OECD uh, in 2013, also looking at the 2010 to 2012 data, they analysed 33 countries and we ended up in 33 out of 33. And you'll find that in a lot of the government um, reports as well, um, calling for action. Interestingly, however, um, a report that came out relatively recently, if you actually look at not the, I guess, percentage or number of businesses that work with universities, but the amount of funding individual academics receive from business, we're actually not doing too well. We're number 15 behind a lot of the Asian countries in that context. Now, obviously, we have to recognise that all of these um, stats are limited in some way. So, for example, the last one, uh, they only uh, looked at a certain number of universities, not all of the universities in Australia. And so we need to recognise some of those limitations. 
The other thing that um, I guess is worth noting here, that a lot of the data that we have is focused only on innovation oriented relationships and collaborations as well. So that's maybe also something to keep in mind as we go through. But really those, uh, these figures um, seem to indicate that we're probably not making the best use um, and you know, taking the best um, opportunity um, that we have and that we, that we could take. So why is that the case? And I, um, we, I get asked that a lot of times. And there's very different perspectives on it. I think one of them, uh, certainly, for example, um, you know, comparing us uh, to some of the European countries uh, that are doing very well in the OECD study, um, historically, they have a lot stronger um, cultural, I guess, um, it's a, a more embedded in their cultural history, um, this, this kind of university engagement. So I was, I'm always thinking about, okay, the tango, for example, in Argentina, it is part of life, it's part of DNA. Yeah, it's just something that is not as easily just, just taken up and we can't as easily just run with it. Another thing, another, I guess, um, issue or barrier that is quite, quite often discussed um, are cultural differences between the universities and businesses. Um, that's actually where my PhD started and how I sort of really got into this kind of topic. And um, if you look at uh, universities, university research groups, uh, business units, yes, they do differ. They do differ in various different ways in their time horizon. Um, they might talk a, a different language um, in, in similar, in, in, um, while trying to talk about the same thing. It might be a different level of flexibility that they have or a different level of bureaucracy. Uh, it might also be a different level of marketing or partner orientation as well. So thinking about that, it is like trying to, you know, partner maybe that Argentinian with, uh, you know, a German like me trying to make me into, you know, this very expressive, adaptive, you know, fast-moving individual which just, um, trust me, I tried, it doesn't work. <laughs> um, so, and that actually makes, uh, makes sense looking at the European-Australian comparison as well. Because if you look at Australia, the majority of researchers are in the public sector. That is not the case in Europe. Uh, so Germany, I'll take Germany as an example because um, that's, I guess, where my background is. The majority of PhD students go into industry. And therefore, what you have is an environment where, you know, people were trained in the academic environment, they were trained in the academic context. So even though they might work in industry, they might work in business, they still have that background, so the cultural challenges might still exist, but are quite a lot easier to overcome, uh, and therefore don't create the kind, same kind of barriers either. Another one, uh, another, I guess, reason might be, well, these partnerships are risky, right? Um, particularly if you think about research. Uh, research is inherently uncertain, yeah? Um, research doesn't follow a predetermined path. So partnering um, in that context requires you um, to rely um, on, um, on the partner, but also thinking about the dancing context again, it requires you to you know, follow different tempo, it requires you to change direction, uh, to twist and turn, which again is, is difficult to do, uh, but also risky um, as well. And finally, we work in a very competitive global environment. So thinking about the visually, visualizing it with the dancing is, well, we have lots of you know, different dancers on the dance floor, so as partners, we have to try and um, you know, together move, uh, move away, find the best direction to not bump into each other uh, and therefore you know, achieve the competitive edge uh, that we were um, aiming for, but doing so in a, um, I guess, smooth and somewhat graceful, close manner. So it really requires us to follow, to lead, to rely. Again, risky and very difficult to do. And this leads me to some of the research um, that we've been doing. Now the first um, study I wanted to talk about um, very much um, focuses on, um, I guess, the importance of that tango, the importance of the dance. Um, and that's the importance of engaging all the different um, parties that are part of the collaboration, rather than keeping at arm's length. Uh, so, you know, we often talk about the, um, uh, the line dance, if you say. So why you might, you know, try and avoid the risk of having to really deal with your partner, uh, you might, you're actually sort of staying at arm's length 
and therefore not actually making the uh, or ach achieving the benefits um, that you might be able um, to achieve. And now this first study was uh, was conducted in collaboration with the um, Institute University of Applied Sciences and was funded um, by the by a DAD um, GO8 grant. And what we try to map and try to better understand here is the different, I guess, um, stages uh, that those collaborations go through and how we actually get to the sort of um, stronger partnerships, the real collaborations, the real working as a team. And what we're able to identify is quite distinct phases and by themselves they might actually not be very surprising to you. We start with a sort of pre-linkage phase where we just try and identify opportunities, individuals, teams, um, so and quite often these happen just through normal conversations as conferences, uh, workshops or through referrals, which leads us into the sort of initiation stage where we actually start getting to know one another, uh, which might lead or hopefully will lead um, to a certain kind of project. Then we have the project phase uh, where we actually develop um, certain processes, mechanisms of working together and hopefully they then lead into uh, a more advanced stage where we go beyond that sort of contractually agreed project but really go into a broader possibility of value creation um, for the parties involved. Now the one thing that um, I wanted to highlight is, is this section here. Um, so one, one of the things that is important to recognise is, is how dynamic I guess relationships are and the fact that they usually don't follow this very straight sort of um, case of, okay, we start with one project, then we do some more, and we, um, you know, happily live ever after. Um, but there, there is likely to be latent phases in there, which doesn't mean that there is no relationship, but there might be um, no current project uh, that might be relevant, um, or, or some other, um, I guess, characteristics that might um, lead to, to a phase where there's just not a lot happening, but it doesn't mean that it can start ag uh, again later on. Now, how is this actually used? Uh, it's used currently in uh, Germany and the UK, uh, a little bit extended, uh, where uh, the universities developed um, a so-called stairway model, um, where how they deal with the partnering on a university level. Um, starting with, I guess, the, um, these phases of getting to know each other, the project, maybe a number of projects. All of these are commonly managed by the individual, the research group, or the school. But then once we go into, I guess, the more um, uh, extensive long-term uh, collaboration, once we go into the pa strategic partnerships, that's where then the, the actual account responsibility leads uh, and, and changes to a more faculty and senior university level. Um, so developed certain, um, or Moonstone in particular, has developed certain strategies um, of how they can move um, collaborations I guess, to, this, to the level that they would like to have this particular um, partnership um, develop. What we found particularly interesting, though, um, was when we looked at what actually are the relational drivers um, across those different phases. And what we, find, what we found is, particularly in the initial interview series, uh, but also then leading into uh, a survey that we did um, of um, academics in Australia, is that the actual relational success factors are the same across the whole time. Uh, communication was the absolute strongest, but also just, I guess, very simple understanding. Uh, trust is something that comes up very often, and the individuals that are really able to, you know, make it, make it work. What we did find now is that even now it's the same kind of characteristics that are commonly noted, it's very important to understand the subtleties because they manifest themselves quite differently in the different, I guess, evolutionary phases. So if I take Kabbalah as an example, communication. So in the initial, I guess, getting to know each other phase, it is very much about um, the quality of communication. Um, so um, what we're generally, so okay, how are we going to make this phase successful? Well, communication needs to be, you know, it needs to be credible, it needs to be complete, it needs to be accurate, it needs to be adequate. Now that by itself though isn't sufficient if we wanted to actually make the project successful where you start talking, which is when we needed a lot more um, a, a two-way approach, a, a dialogue that actually makes, it, makes that, I guess, exchange of ideas, exchange of knowledge happen. And again, 
that goes forward in, in the next phase into actually a discussion or a dialogue that is much broader than the specific project um, into a broader value creation. Another one that I might um, briefly talk about is trust. Uh, because trust is one that comes up um, a lot of times um, in a lot of discussions in this particular context. And usually what we say, trust needs to develop, um, trust is something that you need to give time. Um, what we found out is really already in the initial stages there is a certain level of trust that you can draw on. What is important to recognise is, that, is a, that trust is dependent on the reputation, on the credibility of the other party. Only through the interaction in the next phase can you actually develop trust in the individual and then as you go on over a longer time and in different situations is it that trust in the relationship can actually develop as well. So that development of trust is very important to recognise um, but it's also I guess worth noting that there are certain types of or dimensions of trust that might be available straight early on. And finally the individuals, I won't go into too much depth, um, but really it is a people sport. Yeah, it is people who actually make it happen. So finding those individuals that match and can make it work um, is extremely important. Now bringing this back to, I guess, the dancing example that I used before, really what it means is then we need to um, start maybe with the warm up, um, look into actually practicing because we need to be able to um, understand each other, understand what type of communication we happen uh, we, when we're going to use and what type of communication is going to make a difference um, in, in, in ensuring that we move up the different phases and also just make our collab collaboration um, successful as well. So how is this used at the moment? Well, it's used in some uh, universities primarily in training material um, for researchers who haven't been involved but would like to be involved um, in university business collaboration because I guess it gives you um, some understanding of the subtlety of the things to look for um, in the different phases uh, that you might be involved in. The one thing now with this model, uh, what makes me wonder is, well, we talk about, you know, relationships, evolution. Um, that sort of, for me, brings up straight a red flag because it's oh, okay, that means time. Okay, so if I would come to it from a university side, or but particularly from a business side, it's like, oh, when am I going to see the benefits <laughs> of that? You know, it's, it's, it just actually increases the risk and the uncertainty that is probably involved, um, and that might limit um, some uh, businesses from becoming involved, um, or even some academics in, in becoming involved um, as well. And a lot of the literature talks about the tangible benefits, the patents, um, the individual publications, uh, it might be about the number of you know, PhD students that are graduated. All of those things that actually only really come a little bit later in the process. And that's where um, we're trying to, um, um, colleagues of mine are trying to focus uh, some recent, uh, more, um, yeah, recent research efforts. Because uh, our uh, thinking behind it was, okay, if we can potentially prove that just by communicating um, that you are you know, collaborating, um, that there is something going on between the university and the business. Um, if we can prove that that improves the image, reputation of those parties involved, you know, would that sort of alleviate some of the risk uh, that might be felt, some of the uncertainty, and therefore might get more to actually you know, jump and, and give it a try. So I have to say straight away that our plan is to really look into um, the, the effects on different stakeholders. Uh, so for the university, I think a very important one, obviously, current students, prospective students, alumni, uh, but also from the business. Uh, you know, we need to look at the impact on customers, prospective customers, but also employees, maybe potential employees and other stakeholders. Um, for this, it, as I said, it is very recent. We've only uh, just um, completed a, a very preliminary study where we looked at um, the impact of communication um, in a biotech context, uh, but on a general Australian population context. So we basically showed newspaper articles that talked about different types of collaborations and compared that to perceptions of people who didn't see those um, newspaper articles and therefore weren't sort of, you know, made aware of certain um, collaborations. And while I won't go too much into depth, I guess what I wanted to um, uh, show is if you look at the red, the red, um, section, 
uh, in compared to the others. So the red is the one, um, is the, uh, the means of the, of the perceptions individuals have without uh, being told of the collaboration. Uh, well, the others relate to research or teaching collaborations of research intensive and applied um, universities. And really just on, on you know, the very um, rough um, first sight, you can see the already positive um, difference um, that it made just by talking about this collaboration is happening, it's new, um, and, um, uh, and look, you know, uh, give us some ideas of what you think of the um, partners involved. Uh, so what we found, so we noted a few of them here, um, things like um, reputation for innovation, uh, made it a, a, a more attractive employer, um, brought up the attitude um, of the organisation. Now all things that we know from a marketing um, literature uh, are very important in determining the behaviour of individuals towards a particular organisation. But also positive impact on the university in regards to its image or reputation related to teaching, um, as well as related to research as well. And this, um, I guess, briefly um, leads me to uh, my next point, um, and that is a lot of the um, previous uh, studies, uh, a lot of the research that's been done has purely focused on the research-orientated um, collaboration, as I mentioned earlier. This really only takes into account a very, very minor um, part of all the different possibilities and opportunities um, that exist. Now this is a, a framework, some types um, that were identified and developed um, by the team in Germany that I work with um, at the Münster University of Applied Sciences um, through a project that was funded by, Euro the, by the European Commission. And it gives us a, a large number of different, um, of different types some of them might be more relevant to certain organisations and universities. Some of them might be more risky uh, or less risky. But really, I guess what we um, need to try and understand in a better way is how they actually fit together in particular relationships and also in the portfolio of universities, how they can best uh, apply these different types of partnerships as well. Now, we're currently... Um, and I don't have, I can't actually show any results of that yet, but we're currently analysing um, that data, looking at all of the different barriers that the literature has identified, the barriers and drivers to university business collaboration, and actually seeing whether they apply to all of those different types, or whether they're specific to certain types, which would really help us uh, in developing uh, partnerships in the future. What we find quite interesting so far, there's some, some very, um, very few results, is the sort of the barriers that are commonly noted, like the different organisational cultures, um, also concerns around confidentiality, um, for example, are only related to the research orientated collaboration. They're not relevant or don't actually have a significant impact on any of the other types. Well, things like um, a perceived lack of contact with industry is a barrier to any of these. So what it means is that we might want to actually consider or look at um, some of the other um, types outside of research to maybe start some of those relationships to overcome um, some of those, those barriers um, to the more risky relationships. Now this is uh, also part of the European uh, Commission study um, and what we've done here is we look at uh, close to a thousand responses from senior managers of higher education institutions. So that includes uh, vice-chancellors, deputy vice-chancellors, executive deans um, across 29 different European countries. And we asked them about the level to which they have certain instruments developed in their institutions. Uh, so alumni networks, external promotions. We also asked them, okay, thinking about curriculum development and design, to what extent is business actually involved um, in that process? And what's your thoughts around, you know, whether the curriculum actually meets the needs of the businesses within your region? And the interesting finding for us was at least looking at the resources that is expended by the university, they don't make a difference on whether businesses engage with the university or not. What makes a difference are those, I guess, interaction platforms 
that really allow that um, interaction, collaboration, exchange of ideas to happen. Uh, primarily on the, on the senior level, so looking at you know, managers being on university boards, academics being on business boards, but also a strong development of an alumni network to link in um, with, with former graduates, uh, with former staff. Uh, was very important, as well as just a general, I guess, promotion externally that university business collaboration is a part of the university and is important to the university as well. So leading from that um, to make university business collaboration successful, we need to understand, first of all, the individual that's involved. Yeah, the motivations of the individual, uh, the experience that the individual brings, um, the background um, of the individual, both on the university side as well as on the business side. We also need to understand the team that's around that individual because um, just like, um, like innovation, research, um, teaching, all of these things, um, it, they're team sports uh, really. Very important for it is the, um, the broader organisational environment in which um, things are organised. Um, so there's a lot of literature looking at um, the structures, um, the policies that are necessary, uh, a lot of discussions of the lack of incentives um, for businesses, for universities, but also for individuals uh, to engage um, in these collaborations. The extent to which the interaction platforms that I spoke about are developed uh, at the university. And then look at the relationship, so look at the interface uh, between the university um, and the business um, and, and how we can develop uh, and encourage and foster that relationship. But more so one thing that we don't actually know much about is the broader network. Uh, it's a broader network of all the different universities and organisations that work together, uh, but also linking to the commercial arm, linking to the alumni, uh, linking to the students um, and, and the broader society. Um, as well. Now, I thought I might use, um, I've spoken about the, um, the dancing quite a bit, but I'd like to use to finish off an example that I know is very, um, um, very close to Australians' hearts, and that's cricket. I have to say, coming from Germany, I always thought that we were, you know, sports mad with the soccer that we have and all the, you know, soccer clubs and loyalty. Um, but uh, coming over here, I don't know, 13 years ago, uh, I realised I hadn't seen anything at all <laughs> in relation to sport. Um, but really, the, I guess, there's such a passion around sport here. People live sport. Um, and that, for me, makes me think that there is really a few interesting lessons that we might be able to learn from that context and apply to other contexts, um, such as um, university, uh, university business collaboration. Now, first of all, I think what we have is we have fantastically skilled individuals. We have excellent researchers. Uh, we have fantastic um, and highly expertise in business, science. So we have those, you know, um, fantastic bowlers. And uh, excuse me if I if I'd say anything wrong about cricket because cricket is still the one thing that I will never ever learn. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter how long I'll stay here. Um, so we have those, you know, highly skilled, technically still skilled individuals. But really, um, I think everyone uh, and it goes for every sport, in, including cricket, so I was told, um, just highly skilled and excellent individuals still won't allow you to win the game. Yeah, for that, you need to have a, a strategy. You need to be able to follow the same vision. Uh, you need to be able to understand the roles of all the different people on the field, where they have to stand, what they have to do, um, and really, I guess, have work together as a team to follow uh, that strategy as well. The other thing that you need is what I just spoke about is the background. So you need the coaches, you need the, you know, the clubs behind them, you need the policies in place, um, the, um, you know, all the, obviously, the um, medical experts in this particular context to heal any injuries, um, the, 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 the trainers to, that help you with various different things, and those that de actually develop and implement and, and work with you on the strategy um, as well. So really having that organisational support. The, the two things now that I think that we can really learn from sport, one of them sits up there. The one thing that sport, um, sport clubs, 
individual sports people are extremely good at is creating excitement around themselves, is communicating what they're doing, is, is sort of working the crowd, developing supporters around them. And really these supporters are the ones that make them successful, that allow them to have sponsors, um, that allow them to do a lot of things that strive, uh, thrive as a, as, a, as, a, as a club and as an individual. And I think the one thing that we can learn is actually looking at how, we, how well we understand our, our audiences. You know, the 19th men of, of, of the Crows that I was reminded of the other day. Uh, how we can actually make um, all the different target audiences that we have um, excited about what we do and really be part of and support us uh, in that effort as well. And potentially get some of them um, also to join us uh, in other teams, for example, um, with our alumni. The other thing now that um, I think is an, is an important one that I wanted to highlight and that I'd really like to get your, um, your ideas on as well is really with sport, elite sport, it doesn't just come out of nowhere. What, we, what sport's extremely good at is actually building individuals from very, very young, building them up, building skills, building support, um, building interest in the sport as well. And really, if you think about uh, sort of changing the culture, getting a culture where university business engagement is extremely important and is valued, we have the fantastic opportunity here. We have, uh, you know, the leaders of the research side, we have the future leaders of the business side and the government side coming through the universities, at least a lot of them. Um, we control, I guess, the, the, um, what we expose them to, what is part of their education. Um, so one thing that I think would be worth considering and thinking about is to what extent we actually want to make university business collaboration um, a part of the experience um, that they have uh, within their university. Uh, now at Adelaide, um, with the, with the um, Beacon, um, obviously there's a lot greater focus already on introducing um, any student um, to research um, in, in various different ways. Um, but I think it actually needs to, if we think about the university business collaboration, go further and really think about um, how we can make that, uh, that communication work, how we can develop that understanding so they can take that uh, into their future careers and make it in the future uh, a lot easier for us um, to, uh, to, to engage. So I'd like to finish that with that because um, I spoke to Veronica earlier and said I'd really like to make it a little bit shorter because I'd love to get um, hear some questions but also hear your feedback, hear your ideas um, on the topic um, and I would love to also get some ideas from you on what you think, what kind of research is needed on university uh, business uh, collaboration as well. Now I know that there's a lot of people um, that are similar, uh, crazy like me, are passionate about this topic. Um, and, and determine, I always think if you're, uh, that was my daughter when she I think was seven days old, if you're determined like that, I think you can make things happen. So <laughs> I do uh, like to use her photo um, just to finish off uh, here. So thank you so much for listening and I look forward to hearing your comments and ideas uh, now for the, for the next 15-20 um, minutes. Thank you.